Okay, I have 12 o'clock on my watch. So let's go ahead and start. Welcome to today's webinar. If you need to ask a question, don't forget to use the chat box or the Q&A uh, box. We are recording this webinar, so we will have the recording available after today. This is my contact information. My name is Magali Diaz and I am the Regional Coordinator for Partners Resource Network. Um, my region that I cover is Region 20 and um, Partners Resource Network is a nonprofit agency that operates the PTI, Parent Training Information Center for Texas. And we have regional coordinators all over the state. We are grant funded through the OSIP of Special Education Programs, also known as OSIP. And we provide information and referral, technical assistance, youth leadership training, parent leadership training, and one day symposiums. Today we have Allison Schauberg. Thank you so much for coming back from last week. I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen so we can see your slides. Okay, perfect. Thank you for um, thank you for having us again. It's always nice to be to be back with you. Um, so, as she said, Allison Skaberg, I'm with Consolidated Planning Group. Uh, we are a special needs financial planning firm, and we put a variety of education topics out there as it relates to planning um, for your special needs loved ones. So today, uh, we are going to be talking about college planning uh, for special needs families. And so, what I would say is, um, I'm I'm excited to talk about this today. Um, for a variety of reasons. One, one reason being that, um, you know, I, I, so I do this for a living. So, you know, I'm a parent, I've got four kids, I've got two uh, with special needs, one's, uh, one that's a minor, one that is, um, that is, you know, gone into adulthood. But what I would say is I felt like a mad woman <laughs> whenever I was starting this process um, for my daughter when she was graduating from high school and where do we go and how, would he, how do we go through this. So I'm excited to share some of the things that I learned along the way. I felt like it was like a, um, I mean, I, I felt like it was like my second full-time job of figuring this out um, when, it came, when it came to planning for her and, and for, for college. And, what are we going to do? Where do we go from here? So anyway, I'm glad you're here. Thanks for taking your time to spend some lunch with us, your lunch hour with us. So today, as as we're talking, um, when it when it comes to this, so the, you know, this is I, I like to call this a busy a busy slide, but I think you know, in the very beginning, when when it starts coming down to where do we go from here as far as college considerations, is is really setting realistic expectations, really talking and thinking about the, the the strengths of your loved one, their weaknesses and their strengths, and really thinking about is the traditional path the right path or is the non-traditional path a, a, a right path. Um, I think for, for one, one thing that I see on a common, uh, very, very commonly is that um, you know, we're, we're creatures of, of watching what everybody else does. It starts early. It starts in preschool. It's starting, well, if, if she's in ballet, then he should, you know, all the, uh, all the sports and the activities and everything like that. And if most kids go to high school and then go to college, then they should go to college. They should go to a four-year degree or, or, or what have you. So, um, when you're keeping an open mind and, and really considering all options, some of, some of the options um, may be a non-traditional path at first, but this is not the final, final destination. So for a lot of us, we can get our feet wet. Um, we can see, you know, when, and when we have multiple people on the line, we, we've got people all across the board. Um, we have high functioning autism, we have ADHD, we have other disabilities and, and, and other, other challenges. Some are nonverbal. So, so anywhere across the board, you may fall into this category. But what we often see is, is um, kids with, with disabilities are, are sometimes, I, I hate to use the, the term, but I, I do use the term late to the party. So they might be 18 or they might be 22, but from a maturity level, they're not quite there yet. We're still hopeful. We're still optimistic. We ha still have big hopes and dreams of where they're going, but they're not there yet. So, so the realistic expectations is, is, is really, really important because w sending your child to a four-year university and they're not there yet by four years, 
uh, of maturity, um, we're setting them, you know, really setting them up for, for a failure. So, so some of the things that we're thinking about are, are the transition programs. So this is post 18. So we've got transition programs that are involved in the public school. Some of them are outside of the public school. Some of them start, you know, at 18. Some of them, you know, continue in the public school until age 22, and then they move into a transition program. So, so we'll talk more about those in a little bit. We got trade school, community college, some of those things. We've got the university de degree programs, um, certificates, and licenses. And this is something that really um, spend some time with us. There are thousands of licenses and certificate programs out there that are viable. And actually, people that have these certificates and licenses actually make a pretty good living and, and oftentimes more than what some of their counterparts make that went to a four-year university. So don't discredit that. Um, one thing to think about, too, is a reduced college course load. So, you know, a full-time college course load we know is 12 hours, but that doesn't mean that that's what your 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 child has to do. I mean, so it's putting them in, in a box, right? So if your child can start at with, um, so the Social Security Administration considers the full time course load at eight hours for a person with disabilities. Just so you know, so so eight hours, so so that's four hours less. But even even at that, I mean, you can still reduce it to one class and then add a class and then add a class because we want to have success and we want to build on the success. Okay. Um, uh, thinking about living at home versus on campus. Um, and we have, you know, we will talk about in this presentation partnerships with other organizations that live on campus. Um, we also um, bring up the Texas Workforce Commission. We have we have whole meetings on Texas Workforce Commission and vocational rehab, but um, there are a ton of programs through the Texas Workforce Commission, and um, that are designed about bringing um, bringing out basically a person 14 and up um, to have the skills that they need to be successful in in a viable competitive work setting. And so some of those skills might be training, it might be testing, you know, that the, the, they'll do a myriad of testing to kind of figure out what the deficits are and how, how they can close the gap for your child to be successful. So um, if you are not familiar with VR, I encourage you to check it out. There are some people out there now, um, we've, you know, heard in the past, that they don't call back or they don't follow up or the pandemic made it worse and all all those things are true but they have some true people boots on the ground that are ready to um, help and work with you and do an intake to see if your child qualifies um okay so um a career path ideal work settings there's a you know there's a number of tests out there uh, a lot of them are free that the community colleges have these tests um, that will basically ask some, you know, a lot of personality questions to, to really think about what might be a good path um, for your loved one. So, um, and we just really like to stick with, you know, let's, let's try not to compare people to others because just like us, whether you have disabilities or you don't have disabilities, you're not behind you are where you are. They're not behind. They are where they are. If it takes them four years to graduate or if it takes them eight years to graduate, but they graduate, you just are are where you are. So um, so I think that that's just important to keep in mind. So um, six factors um, for students with learning disabilities that need to, need to succeed. So when it comes to any one of those bullet points and, and different things that you might be considering for your student, um, self-awareness. So again, you know, we 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 talk about that as you know, as far as the individual understanding what their strengths and weaknesses are, and these are things through testing that you may have done um, through your mental health professional. It could have been testing that you have done um, through your local. Um, your local authority could have been testing in the school. It could be testing through VR of, of really understanding what these strengths and weaknesses are. Um, so being proactive, um, persevering, goal setting, and 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 basically having effective social support systems. This is both you know both family. Uh, this is at school. Just having a, a solid support. Um, system and then emotional coping strategies and this is really really important again i understand that we have a lot of different diagnoses on here today 
Um, but the emotional coping strategies is, is super important for some, some diagnoses such as autism, ADHD. When we have um, diagnoses that um, lend themselves from a child or an individual going from zero to 100 very quickly, it escalates quickly and we have meltdowns and some of these other things. So that emotional intelligence and that those coping strategies and all of the things that we can do in that department start early start in middle school, start in early high school, and just keep keep on. It, it, it is a journey and a process, but all of those things are going to be important to success in, in another setting. Okay, so this is where um, this is where I said I felt like a little, a, a bit of a mad woman whenever I started this process with my daughter. Um, so accommodations and offices of disability on the college level. So the first thing that I wanna say the first thing that I learned um, as I, I kind of embarked on this journey is that most schools, community college and university and things like that, most of them have an office of disability. Offices of disability are not created equally. Okay, it's not like this cookie cutter thing that every school has this office of disability and they're super awesome and they're super trained and they're super great. And they have tons of resources and they're just fabulous. Um, there are a lot of them out there that are like that, but there are there are also a lot that um, aren't as robust as some of the other ones. So um, so while most people, you know, they when they, we start looking at schools, we start looking at the degree. OK, so that's one side. You know, do they have the degree path that I'm thinking about? And then, you know, sometimes it's simply just the name of school. We're going to UT or we're going to A&M or whatever it is, right? Um, but I started working this backwards and I started researching the offices of disability. So basically, I made a list of schools that we had some interest in. And I narrowed that list down. I started with 10, which is probably excessive. But I, you know, I started with 10 schools uh, that we had some interest in and that had the degree, the, the, the path that we were looking at. And then I started backwards and interviewed the offices of disabilities. Like, you know, sometimes they, people start going to admissions and they start going and they start doing all these other things. So I was basically able to eliminate several schools right off the bat because I saw very quickly that the office of disability was lacking. And so if I know that I need solid accommodations and I know what those accommodations are, maybe it's audio books, maybe it's voice to text recognition software, maybe it's extra time, maybe it's, um, you know, a, a reduced, they don't usually do a reduced course load, but they'll do extra time and some different things. But if I know that there are some things that I need and good offices of disabilities have this, they pay for this software, the stuff that my my loved one needs, then that's the school that they need to be at because they, your student needs to have the tools and resources that they need at their disposal to be successful. You want to start this process early because you don't want them to start a semester with both hands behind their back without their accommodations. This is so super important. So interview the offices of disability, learn and ask, you know, what sets you apart? What makes you better? Um, you know, you know, how long have you guys, you know, been doing this? You know, how many students do you serve? I mean, you, you can poke around and ask all kinds of questions. So um, also, so when it comes to SAT and ACT, AP exams, college course, graduate level. So there is some talk. There's a lot of talk on the SAT and the ACT um, not being required. There's a lot of schools that are no longer requiring the SAT and the ACT, mainly because of COVID, right? Um, so um, one of the biggest things that I learned, just like the offices of disabilities are not created equally, the schools and what they require and when they require it are not created equally. Okay, so um, basically, um, if you are going to take the SAT or the ACT, there is accommodations. You can Google this, okay, on the SAT, the College Board website on how to apply for accommodations for the SAT and then ACT has a, a similar a similar page. There's a form that, that needs to be filled out and signed off on, and then you'll submit your documents and, the, and those types of things. But it, it can take some time to get those accommodations in place. So if you've got your child already scheduled for the SAT, they're not gonna have accommodations. So if you know your child is gonna be taking the SAT in the coming months, um, 
or even the coming year, I just do it early. Sometimes it, it, I've seen it take as little as two weeks to get approved and I've seen it take as, as long as 12 weeks to get approved. So it's not usually that bad, um, but just do that early. And so again, just determine what accommodations are necessary and, and, and why. But so here's the deal with testing. So you can't just like stand up and say, you know, I need accommodations. Just like in the public school, we have to have testing. We have to have proof of a diagnosis, um, the, the reasoning behind the accommodations. Some schools are easier than others to get accommodations. So if you have proof, um, you know, proof of testing, they usually want it to be updated in the last three to five years. So when is the last testing that you've had done? And honestly, if you've got a kid that's kind of, you know, transitioning and you haven't had testing since they were 12 years old, it's probably a really good idea or plan to go ahead and get that testing done. Um, and what I want to say, and this is not um, this is not a guarantee of services of VR or anything like that. But when you connect with VR, they really do a good job of finding out what is needed for your child. And 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 as far as testing is concerned and things like this, you don't call VR up and say I want you to test them, right? But they they're going to they're going to determine what testing might be necessary. So it is possible that there could be coverage for this type of service through through VR or some of these things to determine um, determine needs, learning differentials and other things like that. Okay, so um, of, of course, reasonable accommodation in the workplace if it doesn't uh, pose undue hardship, and there's some information on that at the Department of Labor and the Job Accommodation Network. So when it I, all I can say is I just can't stress this enough. We see kids all the time that are starting school. They don't have their accommodations. They don't have the stuff in place. They call the, the psychologist and the psychologist says, yes, I can do testing for you in three months. <laughs> the, the, the mental health professionals with the pandemic are very busy right now. So, so just plan ahead on that. Okay. Okay, so so one of the things that we were um, talking about is you know post high school options for special needs day and um, transition programs. So some of these, so this is the um, maybe right now, and again, uh, depending you know on who who we have on here, we have some people that are going to go to a four year university. We've got some people that are going to go to a, a community college. Some people are going to do a certificate program, but some people might be ready to move to a transition program. And our goal is that um, long term, we're going to move into one of those programs that I just mentioned. But in the meantime, we're still building maturity. We're still um, building skills. We're still working on our emotional regulation and other things like that. So this is just a list. We're not affiliated with any of these organizations. All of these organizations are good. They're their own companies. Um, you know, some of them take, um, you know, take uh, waivers, some of them don't. And this is something that you might just want to research on your own. But what, what I would say for this is if you have a high school student, researching some of these sooner versus later is good. Okay. And what I suggest is getting yourself on a waiting list, finding out if they have waiting lists, getting yourself on the waiting list. So that way your child isn't 18 or 22 and you say, wait, um, I think we need to go to a transition program. And then you contact these and they say, oh, well, we're, we're full. You know, we have limited capacity right now because of COVID and we're full and we have a, a, a one year. We've seen anywhere up, up to a five year waiting list. A lot of them are, are, are less than that. But if you're wanting to do something right now, it's a shame to find out that you're on a two year waiting list. OK, so mark those down. I think these are just all worth um, checking out and, and, and seeing. And, and again, you put yourself on a waiting list. You're not obligated to go there, but then at least you have a choice um, if your slot opens up that you, you can. OK. All right, so this is um, this is a, a, a list. I, I call it a short list. It, it's kind of long um, of of some of the programs that we are aware of um, in in Texas. Actually, a couple of them, uh, Lynn University, that is not in Texas. That's actually in Florida. But um, so these are our programs, uh, educational options post high school for individuals with disabilities. Um, so. These are all programs. This is probably, if I was going to take a picture of a slide, and we will send out this recording later um, with our slides, this is probably the slide that I would take a picture of. Um, each of these programs are, are different are different programs. They might be a certificate program. Um, you know, UT has one where they actually have, um, where they live on campus. 
Um, some of them are a, a, dig, a degree program. It just it just depends. And, and so basically each of their websites is going to talk about what the program is, who they serve, what they do, how long the program is, and kind of what you can expect. And one of the questions that I would add to the list um, in light of COVID is just really um, asking about if they're meeting, um, if they're meeting face to face, or if they're they are um, meeting virtually, and what their status is, and kind of the plans um, as they ha go forward. So, what we don't pretend to be is a specialist on all of these programs. This is just a handful of them that we know about, that we've heard good things about. Some of them, you know, um, like uh, for instance, you know, Lone Star Community College. Um, we've we've heard repeatedly over and over and over again, even not their Life Path program, but just the community college that they work very well with individuals with disabilities. That they that they really strive and they work hard, um, you know, working with with families. Um, Texas Tech. Um, excuse me, Texas State Tech, I think that's up here in Richmond or Rosenberg. Um, that is one that doesn't necessarily have a, um, you know, like a special needs program, if you will, but what this is geared towards um, are engineer brains. Your, 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 your autistic kids that are wired engineer brains, this is a great place for them. And the word on the street is that they work very well with um, individuals with disabilities. So it's worth it's worth checking out. So, so whether your program, like, you know, for instance, um, my, my daughter, my daughter's at Sam, at Sam Houston in the Office of Disability. She's a junior there. There, the Office of Disability at Sam, Sam Houston State has been fantastic. They, they've been absolutely wonderful. So she's not in any particular special program, but she has all of her accommodations through. Um, through the Office of, of Disability there, and they're, they're just beautiful to work with. So, so consider all options, but these are some of the specialized programs that I've put here. Um, but consider all of your options if you've got a high-functioning, and we see a lot of high-functioning kids um, that are very brilliant. Um, and we, we see a lot of um, gifted and talented kids with disabilities as well. So I, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to go into, you know, a, a, a different program. I mean, they can go to the regular university as well um, with those accommodations. Okay, so um, this is one of the things we talked about is, um, you know, if, if you're living on campus, if, you're, if your child's living on campus, are they ready for that? We talked about delaying or maybe they, they um, live at home or whatever. Uh, there are two, two programs that we're aware of. So the college living experience, basically, um, <clears throat> So they have individualized post-secondary guidance and instruction. They're they're out of Austin, so so basically the college living experience. Um, uh, most of these kids go to the community college, um, and uh, but they they live there. They live with the college living experience, and they're they're working on independent living skills, social development, all of those types of things. Now. This is a really great program, um, but it is cost prohibitive for a lot of families. Okay, so this is not this is not the cheapest program in the whole wide world. And then you would also be, um, you know, you would also be paying for the community college as well. I would say that this would come in in the neighborhood, just you know, give or take a a, a little bit, but in the in, in the neighborhood of forty to fifty grand on, a year on on the college living experience. Okay. But they're very good at what they do, and this is, you know, really teaching your um, your your child to be independent, and and, and it's it's taking some of that um, off of you, um, which I mean, they get to this age and they don't want us to be involved anyway, and and it's them being accountable to somebody else as well. Okay, so if you have any interest in the in the, in the college living experience, there's their their contact information. We'll send that out as well. Another program, and we've done a Zoom meeting on this before um, <clears throat> with Bloom Consulting. And, and what I want to say is um, today I'm just kind of talking about their Campus Connections program. Um, the Campus Connections program is, is, is basically this program that is designed, it's kind of a wraparound program. So your student is at the university, they do have a deal, they have a specific partnership with Sam Houston State University, so I know that. They've got one another with another campus, but it's not in the state of Texas, and I don't remember, it might have been in Nevada, but anyway, um, they're working on additional connections. But basically, this wraparound um, program is, is really empowering the student to problem solve, do their own stuff, 
work more effectively. They, they want them to be successful. And again, it's having a consultant that they're soundboarding some of these ideas off the accountability, the coaching, and all of those things are coming from the counselor uh, that you that you have through Bloom. Um, and the cost for this is much more affordable at $1,000 per month private pay, or they say on their website to contact your VR counselor. So this is another example that when you're content, when you're working with um, uh, with vocational rehab, uh, you know, through the the Texas Workforce Commission. Um, I'm not here to say what they will or will not pay for, but they do have money and they do have funding and they do want your loved one to be successful. They do want to put the tools and resources in their hands that they need to be successful. They're in charge of assessing your loved one and determining what those tools and resources are and will you know, decide what they're going to move forward with it. But this is just uh, just a, certainly another example of how can we do this alongside. So if we are going to go to the university or, or, or any other program, this may be something that you want to look at. And furthermore, what I would say with Bloom is this is um, worth a, a little trip to their website because they do all kinds of stuff. They, they do all kinds of assessments, private assessments, uh, vocational assessments. Uh, they, they do a, a, a tremendous amount uh, of work as it relates to to our community. And so you might want to see the various services that they provide and see if that's something that might be a fit for for you and your student as you're you're thinking about transitioning. Okay, so what about funding? Um, I got my money tree here, and of course, money doesn't grow on trees. We wish it, we wish it did. But when it comes to funding, um, I always talk about, and I, you know, maybe we're remiss in talking about this. Everybody knows about the FAFSA, but you do and you don't until you've done it. If you've done it previously for other kids, then you know that. If you got younger kids, you haven't kind of gone down that highway in quite a while. So the FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid. Um, it's available each year, October 1st, for the following school year. So what we hear all the time is people say, um, oh, I make too much money. I don't need to fill out the FAFSA. You need to fill out the FAFSA. Even if you think you make too much money, fill out the FAFSA every year. Um, when it comes to FAFSA and what is counted, um, so if you're planning, if you're planning ahead, it's smart to have money in the right buckets when it comes to FAFSA. So basically the things that aren't counted against you in FAFSA are your IRA, your 403B, your 401k, your qualified money is basically not counted against you in FAFSA. Um, if it's living in the confines of cash value, life insurance, and basically annuities. When you have money sitting in mutual funds and other, other, other places, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, savings accounts, all of those types of things, it is it is counted against you. So the basic thing that you need to know and why you need to complete it no matter what, even if you think you make too much money, most of the scholarships, which is the next thing on the list, require that the FAFSA has been completed. Okay, so by not completing the FAFSA, then you automatically disqualify yourself from many of the scholarships that are out there. Um, so when it comes to scholarships, and this was another, I, I, I laughed because it, it was back then, but um, this was almost another full-time job. I mean, we, we really started early in, in, in junior high, middle school, or whatever, freshman year, really looking at what scholarships are out there. How are we going to qualify for them? What do we need to do? What do we have to prove? How do, how do we set ourselves apart? So figuring, doing this activity junior year is a little bit late, Okay. So are there still scholarships out there for you to apply for? Absolutely. But we started this process very early and we had a whole spreadsheet of, you know, what were the community-based scholarships, all, all these schools. So if, if you had 10 schools on your list, all the 10 schools had all kinds of scholarships that were available through the school. But then there's a whole bunch of other scholarships, disability, disease-based. Man, there's even sibling scholarships for kids with disabilities, you know, all kinds of different things. It could be sibling um, scholarships for, for, for children, um, for, for siblings that had Down syndrome or cancer or any, any number of them. So be creative when you're Googling like some of these scholarships that are out there. So for us, one of the things that I, I didn't put on here and I, I name it specifically, but it's worth looking up for because it's for Texans, okay? So this was, this was one that we got and honestly, it was a blessing. It was such a blessing. So it's the Terry Foundation Scholarship, okay? So when we started 
you know, this process, I thought, okay, so how do you get scholarships? You get scholarships academically based, you get um, scholarships for, you know, athletics, you know, sometimes music, um, but there are, are a lot of scholarships basically for volunteerism, okay? And so, so I basically checked off and said, okay, we're, you know, we're, you know, we're, we've got, you know, average test scores, we've got decent grades, we're not athletic, we don't play music, so no, 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 we're not going to get scholarships in that, in that area. So, so what I figured out early on is how, how can we get scholarships? And, and the answer was through volunteerism. So the Terry Foundation Scholarship is actually out of Houston, okay? It's out of Houston. It's for Texans, okay? Texans only. And um, it is a heavily endowed, it'll never run out of money uh, scholarship. It's one of the largest um, scholarship foundations in, 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 the, in the United States. And so basically, uh, they look at need. They look at, um, you know, basically people that have, you know, a powerful story, people that have rose above some of their challenges in their life. And if you've got kids with disabilities that have succeeded and they've rose above some challenges, but it could be any challenge. I mean, it could be any challenge in their life, anything that has happened, you, maybe your house flooded in Harvey, any, anything could have happened. There could have been a d divorce or anything. And, and they're looking for um, an individual that was, that is giving back. Okay. So this is for 13 schools, 13 state, it has to be a state school in Texas, but all the schools that count are in there. So, so we got A&M, we got UT, we got Texas Tech, we got Texas State, we've got um, Stephen F. Austin, Sam Houston. And the cool thing is, is when you apply for this, you apply for it, the Terry Foundation Scholarship through each of those schools. So the more you apply, the more chances you have, meaning so if you apply for it at A&M and you apply for it for UT, you might not have qualified for it at A&M, but maybe you got it at UT, right? So so anyway, the bottom line is, is um, for kids that have meaningful service work. So it, at the end of my daughter's high school career, she had 900 service hours. This was on purpose. This was definitive. We had a plan and we worked our plan. We didn't do sports. We didn't do other things. She volunteered with a few meaningful organizations. She volunteered with Hope for Three. She volunteered with the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. She uh, volunteered with YIP, which is Youth in Philanthropy. And, and so she had a ton of service hours, but the bottom line is, is she uh, got herself, not based off of grades, not based off of test scores, she got herself a full ride scholarship, paid for everything. And, and so anyway, research that one, check it out. Terry Foundation, is, it's worth your while. Um, so, so kind of moving forward, research early and know your deadlines. So this was something that was challenging to me. And again, having that spreadsheet that we we're talking about um, is important because each of these schools, their applications, their schol scholarship deadlines, um, even, even for that Terry Foundation scholarship, the deadlines might be different for all 13 schools that offer the scholarship, right? So um, you can e very easily miss your deadlines. A lot of the deadlines are uh, November 1st, and a lot of the deadlines are December 1st. So there are some that kind of move over into the spring, February and April. So basically, your child's a senior in high school and they just started school in August and the deadlines for the scholarship for next year are November and December. So to put that into to context for you. So, so research this ahead of time. So 529 college savings plans, that's another place that we can pull money from uh, to, to pay for college um, should, we, should we need to. If your child is going to qualify for SSI, and Medicaid based off of their disability, the, the distributions from the college savings plan for the benefit of the child could affect that. Right now, if the 529 is set up in your name and the child is the beneficiary <clears throat> and there's no distributions happening, there, that's not going to affect SSI and Medicaid. Um, one way around that is having an ABLE account. So if you have a disabled child, um, that may or may not go to college or higher education or learning, um, you may want to switch the 529 plan to an ABLE account. You can only switch $15,000 a year, okay? Kind of convert it over to an ABLE account. So an ABLE account is about achieving a better life for an individual with a disability. But the cool thing about the ABLE account, it's under 529A. So College plans are 529C, this is 529A, so they act the same, only an ABLE account can pay for a lot more things than what a, a 529C can. 
The cool thing about the ABLE account is it'll pay for college. It can pay for um, it can pay for a university, community college. It can pay for tutoring. It can pay for all, all kinds of stuff. All 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 as well as is is going towards achieving a better life for that individual with a disability. So those are something to think about. Okay, and we talked about the vocational rehab several times and about providing support if it's in line with the goals established within the plan. So this could be um, classes. This this could end up being, you know, university or community-based college or, or other classes out there. We've seen um, some people's plans, um, you know, helping with those types of classes as well. Okay, so um, you know we've we've kind of come to the end, you know, of the of the college planning, um, you know, the Zoom here, and these are basically topics that should be on your special needs planning radar if you're if you have a child that's transitioning, um, uh, you're kind of thinking about these things. Again, this is maybe one that you'll kind of take a screenshot of. Um, we have a lot of um, a lot of meetings, a lot of educational meetings about these these following topics where we take a deeper dive on some of the things that we kind of just scratched, you know, scratched the tip of the surface on. Um, but we we just want you to have this on your list as you're thinking about where am I going and, you know, how are we going to get there um, as it relates to special needs planning. All these things need to be on your list. And, and one thing uh, that I just want to, you know, I, I touched on SSI and Medicaid. Um, we again, we have whole presentations about this, but but basically, what you need to know is if your child has not qualified for SSI and Medicaid, it was based off of your assets prior to them turning 18. When they turn 18, um, you, you need to you know start that process of applying again um, because it's based off of their assets at the time. So what you want to do before you apply, you want to make sure that you have the money in the right buckets. Um, you will be denied if the child has assets in their name over $2,000. So they can have up to $2,000 all sources, okay? Um, uh, they can have one car, they can have one house. So as long as they have less than $2,000 and either one car or no car, and most of them don't have a house, they still live with you, um, you, you should be okay in applying. And what we suggest is just gathering all the necessary planning, you know, documents to apply, which is going to be a history of their diagnosis, um, basically dates of diagnosis, any medications that they take, um, what their disability affects, those types of things, and then names, address, and phone numbers of um, primary care physician and any specialist that your kids see. Uh, if you have any of the neuropsych testing or anything like that that has previously been done or, or clear records, uh, that is also helpful. So, um, Magali, I'm going to turn this um, back over to you. Um, I, I'd like to just open it up for questions right now if we have any specific questions in the chat box or the Q&A. Yes, uh, there are... Um... Okay, let's go to the SSI one since you just finished talking about SSI. Elizabeth is asking if the SSI requirements of the 2000 include the 529 money. So the 529 money basically, so 529C, it just depends on what you're talking about, right? So ABLE does not disqualify. So if a person has a, an ABLE account, that's an allowed resource. So an ABLE account, a special needs trust, you can have more money than that $2,000 in those two accounts and it won't disqualify you. In the 529C, the 529C is basically in your name, like whoever bought it, like mom or dad's name, and then you have a named beneficiary. So the 529 money is not going to count against you um, for the SSI, but the distributions from the 529 could be questionable if they went out for the benefit of the said um, SSI recip recipient. So, so, so some people, again, They'll take a 529 and they'll convert $15,000 a year into an ABLE account. Other people will change the beneficiary on the 529 to one of their other children as opposed to their disabled child. There's, so there's some workarounds on that. Okay, so related to that, Walter is asking, what is the maximum that can be in the ABLE account? $100,000 before you disqualify from, um, from SSI. So. $100,000 is the max and $15,000 a year is the max that you can put in unless you're working 
And I think that there's another, uh, that's a different presentation, but I think there's an additional 12, uh, 12 or $13,000 that you can put in if the individual is working above the 15,000. And the foundation that you were talking about, um, what was the name of the foundation? Uh, the Terry Foundation, um, that's T-E-R-R-Y, Terry Foundation. And it, they have a nice website and you can research all that. And then the, the, the specific schools, again, all state schools, it doesn't count towards any private schools, um, but there's, there's 13 schools, Stephen F. Austin, Sam Houston, and kind of all the, all the rest of the ones that you would expect as far as state schools. In, in Texas, it covers. And for that volunteer um, scholarship, do the hours count from middle school through high school? That is a good question. And I would direct that towards them. I, you know, I think what they were really looking at was the whole, the, the whole individual. So I, yes, we, we did. So my daughter did have um, middle school hours as well. Um, but what I would say is the hours you want them to be meaningful with the same organizations like you know like everybody says oh yeah i volunteer at my church like everybody says that um and then what they really volunteer is not that much but like meaningful it, with a particular um organization that maybe you feel passionate about or you actually enjoy there's dream league where they they um they, they do sports um, with kids with disabilities. There's so many things, but it's, it, to me, it's, and it doesn't always have to be, you know, that you're volunteering with kids with disabilities. That's not what you have to do, but it, it's just something meaningful. If it's, if it's the food bank or there, there's just so many, but it's consistent. It's like, you know, and then the reason you're doing this consistent as well with these organizations is because when it comes to recommendation letters, um, when your child has volunteered with some of these organizations, um, you just be, I was, I was just honestly taken aback by the, the recommendation letters that came from the organizations that my, my daughter had volunteered um, for. I mean, they were just amazing as opposed to getting your pastor to write a recommendation letter or getting your, you know, your best friend to write a recommendation letter for your son. It looks a lot better when you've got this record, this glowing recommendation letter from an organization that does great things from a person um, of, uh, of, of, of clout in, in the community. Um, it, it bodes so much better than some of those other recommendation letters. So that, that's the reason why. Okay, um, Kelly asked this question early on, so I hope she's still on here and she can elaborate. Um, how well does this translate to someone who's severely impacted by their ADHD traits and challenges? I think she was talking to the accommodations in the beginning. Um, Kelly, if you're still on here, if you can elaborate. <laughs> So, um, well, and I, I can talk to that a, a little bit as far as the accommodations are concerned for ADHD and for, um, you know, basically for school and ADHD, like where do we, where do we go from here? And I think that's where that testing comes in and kind of going back to that beginning slide that we were talking about of, you know, wh where are they? What are their strengths and their weaknesses? What are they right now? What are they expected in the future? And so, for many, um, I, I actually do lead the support group for ADHD parents in Fort Bend County. And um, so I do have a lot of experience of, uh, of this, but what I would say is a lot of times it's just a little bit later. It's just a little bit delayed um, as to that next step. So what we see a lot of the ADHD kids are going into either um, a transition program or getting a certificate or a license, maybe taking a few classes at the community college. Maybe it's one class at the community college. They have a, a, a introduction to university studies or, or college studies or something like that. And it's basically a class that teaches them how to be a college student. Um, so, you know, taking a couple of classes and before move, moving on. But as far as ADHD is concerned and accommodations, that is truly um, a diagnosis warranting accommodations, both in the IEP or a 504 in the public school setting in younger years, but as well as on um, the college level. And some of those accommodations look like extra time, um, extra time on test. It could be um, having a note taker. It could be um, 
I, I, again, it could be audio books, it could be voice to text recognition software. There's a lot of different things that are, are, are available out there, but I would definitively say that those accommodations are necessary for success um, on, a, on a higher level, for sure. And I think they can just go back and look at the accommodations they had in high school, right? Um, like the summary of their program in high school and what worked for them. And, and some, yeah, so I think that they will look at those. And then accommodations on the college level, sometimes they have more tools and resources than what the, 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 the public schools, not necessarily more, but different. Um, and, you know, different how they like do things like on a, on a, on a, you know, high school level, elementary, uh, you know, level, there could be a something in the, 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 the 504, or the IEP reducing assignments, or um, this child will only do half of the math problems or something like that. That doesn't really happen on the college level. Okay. So it, you don't get reduced assignments. You might get extra time to complete assignments, but getting a pass on a, an assignment or doing every third problem is not how it works on the college level. Okay, that's all the questions in the Q&A box and the chat box. Well, thank you so much, Allison. Oh, one more, hold on, Elizabeth is typing. Would I find the accommodations on the Office of Disabilities website? Uh, can you find like a list of accommodations? Um, so she, she wouldn't know what to ask for her daughter. So yeah, so so basically in, in working with the public school, um, working with the public school and the testing that they've done, um, you know, before, like if you, if you know that, um, like, like for instance, um, you know, a, a child with processing speed delays, like some kids have had cancer, they've had chemo, they have other issues, they have other diagnoses, and maybe they have processing speed delays. Okay. So that would be one that we know for sure, you know, of the extra time. And, and really, honestly, this is where I was kind of talking about the quality of the Office of, of Disability. It's going to help you with this. So you don't have to feel like you have to know all the answers or anything like that. Um, they all do have, um, you know, websites and saying, how do you apply? How do you get a How do you get accommodations? what is required. And then once you apply and you submit your documentation and they have determined, yes, um, this, this individual is going to qualify for accommodations, then basically what they do is they set up a meeting um, to talk to you about what are some possible accommodations. So that in that meeting, you can say, what are some possible supports that you, you feel right off the bat could be helpful. And again, it's not in stone. So like, this is like reevaluated every semester. And so if we find, and, and it can be reevaluated mid-semester. So if we find we're struggling or something, or I need this note taker, or I need this voice text, you know, recognition software, or I need like for some of um, our distracted kids um, taking a test in a testing center in a quiet environment instead of the class. Some of our kids have anxiety. So sitting in a class with 50 kids, taking an exam, they're going to get an F every time because they're freaked out. So that's, you know, in a, taking a test in a small setting, um, in a quiet setting with extra time and things like that. Those are, those are just um, some, some of the, the main ones. But I think that they'll just basically help you determine that. And then also, like I said, through the public school, if you already have accommodations, um, you may have already know, you may already know of some of the supports that you're um, loved one has already had in place that helped them um, move the bar and, and be successful. Yes, I think like you said, just interviewing them would kind of, you know, guide you and are they going to provide the accommodation that they had in high school? Yeah. And, and for me, it was just like, like I said, it was like finding out, well, so what software do you have? Like, like, um, so like, for instance, Kurzweil is a software of that, 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 um, 
the audio, like read it, the reader. I mean, so basically you get these textbooks, you get these ADHD brains and you've got this chapter, you got five classes and you got to read two chapters in each class. Like they're overwhelmed. So that audio book and being able to listen to that audio book. So Kurzweil is one, some of them have some different ones, but asking them, what kind of software do you have for audio books? What kind of software do you have for voice to text recognition software? Can you buy this yourself? Yes, you can. So um, Dragon Speak is one of them. Kurzweil is another. Uh, learning Ally. This is something that a lot of the, the the public schools don't talk about. But basically, even right now, Learning Ally is one with a diagnosis that you can get books um, get books converted to audio. And you know, now with Kindle and some of these other, there's a lot of apps out there that make audio books a, a little bit more um, easy to to get than than others. But but just researching what some of the tools of the trade are when it comes to um, accommodations and, and, and software and, and supports that your child could need and what is available through that Office of Disability is helpful. Again, you can buy them yourself, but why? If, if all these other Offices of Disability provide them, why should I, you know, why should I buy this, you know, myself, you know, so, so that was just a, a consideration that I had, but again, had done research on all of these different options out there and, and kind of figured out what it was that we needed to do. Great. Thank you so much, Allison, for all of the information. We had a lot of questions. So I think people were really engaged and interested in the information today. Thank you all for sharing uh, or spending your lunch hour with us. There's an end uh, at the end of the webinar. There's a survey if you can fill it out so we can, um, you know, give some information on what other topics you guys want to hear. And um, as Allison said, um, she will be emailing out presentations and a recording link. For sure. Thanks so much for having us again, um, Magali. I appreciate it. And we look forward to serving all of you in the future. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.